Hello and welcome to Talking Churchill. I'm Dr. Warren Doctor, and today we'll be discussing Winston Churchill and the Classics. Joining me from the University of Exeter is Professor Richard Toy. Hi Warren, it's good to be here. There has of course been an enormous amount of uh, academic research done on uh, the reception of the classics during Victorian Britain, uh, particularly on its effect on what I'm going to call the imperial education. And I was hoping, Richard, that you might uh, talk to us a little bit about the effect on Churchill's education in particular. By his own account in my early life, his autobiography, which was published in 1930, Churchill got on really very badly with the classics at school. And there is a passage in which he describes how when he first arrived at boarding school, at his prep school, and was left alone uh, for the first time, the hen master set him the task of learning the first declension, uh, which he did uh, very successfully. He memorized it. The, the, the teacher came back and uh, he spouted it out. and the headmaster praised him, but then Churchill made the mistake of saying, well, what does it mean? And the, uh, if there's a very good passage in my early life where uh, Churchill describes what happened next. Uh, Mensar O-table is the vocative case, he replied. But why O-table? I persisted in genuine curiosity. O-table, you would use that in addressing a table, in invoking a table. And then seeing he was not carrying me with him, you would use it in speaking to a table. But I never do, I blurted out in honest amazement. If you are impertinent, you will be punished and punished, let me tell you, very severely, was his conclusive rejoinder. So Churchill uh, really tells this very amusing story of how he found the classics very problematic. But actually, perhaps the story is more, more complex than that, because, of course, he was uh, sort of surrounded by this classical teaching. Latin and, and, to a lesser extent, Greek were very important parts of the curriculum at Harrow, where he uh, went when he was older. And although he undoubtedly struggled to a degree and was um, you know, sort of relegated, as it were, to sort of learning English more systematically, which he, he which he very much appreciated. Um, he certainly did have uh, important classical influences. So, for example, um, he was able to memorize and won a prize for memorizing 1,200 lines of uh, Macaulay's The Lays of Ancient Rome. So he did actually um, although that, that, of course, was in English rather than Latin, there was a, there was a very sort of strong element of, of, um, sort of information that he was getting about ancient Rome. Where, whether or not that was necessarily you know, accurate information is a different question. He also, for example, uh, talks about uh, Punch magazine, which he looked at at one of his prep schools, um, which had lots of cartoons of Gladstone being portrayed as Julius Caesar and and. The young church were concluded from this that the church that uh, um, Julius Caesar was a very sort of upright, admirable person, and was then kind of quite shocked when he subsequently learned what what Caesar was actually like. Well, that certainly would have been uh, an education for Churchill. Um, but beyond this sort of standard Victorian education, uh, which of course many of Churchill's contemporaries also had. Uh, what sets Churchill apart? I mean, one of the most uh, obvious things is the fact, of course, that when he went out to India, he he underwent his own sort of self-education. And I wonder what uh, the effects of his self-education were on his relationship with the classics. Well, when Churchill went out to India with the army as a young man, he really felt that his previous education had been lacking and set about trying to educate himself by basically reading whatever he could get his hands on. And that included uh, Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which was a book that his father, Lord Randolph Churchill, had very much admired. And so, again, although Churchill um, was not reading Latin, he was certainly getting a lot of information about the ancient world. 
uh, not only through Gibbon but through through other writers as well, including Winwood Reed. Uh, and so, so some of this information was would now be considered you know, sort of wrong or outdated. Uh, was certainly you know, very eclectic, and uh, Churchill wasn't necessarily getting the latest scholarship, but nonetheless he was um, being. Uh, informed, there, there was a, sort of drawing on the late Victorian culture in which uh, classic, the classics in general, not necessarily through the direct learning of, of, of ancient languages, were nonetheless very important. I, I think that that's a very important point, especially as it relates to Churchill's uh, conceptualization of the British Empire and what he perceived to be its uh, civilizing mission. Um, However, if, if we move beyond a sort of literary or intellectual understanding of Churchill's relationship with the classics, what do you think the effects of the classics were in his political life? Well, you know, in a way, the fact that Churchill had struggled to a degree with Latin and Greek, uh, perhaps not in the end so problematic after all, that he had worked very much on his English, his writing of English, which was a great advantage to him, of course, uh, both in his publications and in his speeches, but also um, the the era when politicians would sort of swap Latin tags in Parliament, would expect each other to understand them. This was rather fading away, particularly with the dawn of uh, sort of universal suffrage after World War One, and so with the influx of large numbers of Labour MPs, some of course who were middle class and would themselves have gone to uh, public school, uh, but also many who were not, so an, an influx of working class MPs, the atmosphere in the House of Commons changes and um, it, of course it, it is less important and perhaps less appropriate for MPs and politicians to be using uh, classical tags in their in their public rhetoric, and so although in some respects the discussion of Rome remains important in debate, and Sarah Butler in her book Britain and Its Empire in the Shadow of Rome uh, does show how the, the um, the ways in which Rome was was used in, in political debate changed over time and that Britain lost its great power status or its great power status was increasingly under threat, one might better say, um, so that the decline of Rome was, was used in, in different ways as a warning. Um, but in a sense, it was, was certainly not a disadvantage to Churchill that he didn't have a, a, a particularly excellent grasp of Latin in, in such a way uh, this might have been rather different for, say, a mid-Victorian politician. The most striking thing that occurred to me, Richard, when you were discussing that, is the fact that Churchill's relationship with the classics almost serves as a lens onto 20th, 20th century British history. And uh, you can see that as various stratas of, the, of society were becoming members of Parliament, and once universal suffrage had been achieved, that the sort of utility or even the usefulness of this sort of elite language uh, suddenly went away and it would lose all currency in, in the House of Parliament. I mean, what's interesting as well is that we know uh, that Churchill's views of the classics changed. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? We can see, as I said earlier in my early life, 1930, a degree of scepticism about them, perhaps. Also, in a letter which he writes to uh, his former schoolmaster Robert Somerville in 1927, he says that he thinks that the teaching of English is more important than the teaching of the classics. But if we move through to 1948, when he on, on the occasion when he's receiving an honorary degree at the University of London, he actually comes out and explicitly says that he has changed his mind about the classics. And he says, I had very strong views about them when at Harrow. I have changed my mind about them since. Knowledge of the ancient world and of Greek and Roman literature was a great unifying force in Europe, which I now fear is rapidly becoming extinct. And I should like to say that university education ought not to be, be too practical. So that is rather interesting quotation, uh, because, of course, Churchill 
is very much associated with the idea of scientific education. The founding of Churchill College was very much about the need to have more engineers and more scientists in the Cold War period. And uh, um, certainly Churchill did see that as, as being an important priority. But as he said in that very speech, um, we want a lot of engineers in the modern world, but we do not want a world of engineers. So in fact, uh, in spite of his um, problems in his, his childhood with uh, struggling somewhat with Latin and Greek, he actually did come to value this and see it more see it as more important uh, towards the end of his career. I also think it's important to note that when Churchill, I mean, as you said in his speech, he talks about the, uh, he talks about how how Latin, the study of Latin, became a unifying force for Europe, uh, and it was one of the things that 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 tied Europe together. And I think that this is very important to note that when he's making this speech, is of course after the speech that he had made in 1946, where he calls for the United States of Europe. So one of his primary political or geostrategic goals is a sort of unified Europe at the time. So it's it's very interesting to see how he has changed his position on the classics, uh, perhaps because on the one instance he does genuinely feel like it is a necessary for a, for a proper education, but also because it was politically useful. Um, but that's all the time we have today for Talking Churchill. Thank you for sticking around for an extra long uh, uh, edition, and uh, we'll see you the next time. Thank you so much for tuning in.